Good morning, everyone. I, too, want to add my warm welcome to this uh, woman's uh, journey. Um, I, too, want to thank uh, Harriet Legum and all the co-chairs for the opportunity to be here because it is an opportunity. I really look forward to your questions because they always make me uh, think harder. I am Cindy Sears. I am an infectious diseases specialist who has worked at Johns Hopkins for the last 26 years. I started out in the field of diarrheal diseases, uh, working in global health, and that work led me to the question of how bacteria may be contributing to colon cancer, so a marked uh, change in direction, and that led me to become immersed in the world of the microbiome, which is what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. So I always like to start with three questions. Before you walked in this room today, how many of you have heard of the microbiome or the microbiota? Just show your hands. So a good percentage. How many of you would have been comfortable turning to your neighbor and explaining what the microbiome or the microbiota was? <laughs> Fewer hands and a few laughs, OK. And my last question is, how many of you take probiotics because they believe you help, they help you? Quite a few people. All right, well, we'll return to that topic uh, a little bit later. So I have three goals this morning. First, I'm going to tell you what the microbiome or the microbiota is. So hopefully you will feel comfortable uh, talking to your neighbor about it. Then I'm going to tell you why we think the microbiome is essential to your health. And then I'm going to tell you about the frontier of microbiome work, and that is how we're beginning to try to understand how changes in the microbiome may be contributing to disease development, a topic that was introduced, just introduced by Dr. Mano. So the, micro, the term microbiome refers to all the genes in all the bacteria on your body, and the word microbiota refers to all the individual microbes, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi that you carry with you. Now, I have to say, for casual conversation, use the two interchangeably. It's just important that you understand that you are a colony of creatures. You have far more microbes on your body than you have human cells. And when we get to the gene content, you have logs more genes from all those microbes that you carry than you actually have human genes. So we, we understand that we are really a colony of, of microbes, of, we're a colony of creatures. So how did uh, this idea evolve? Well, like many things in medicine, uh, it's not a new idea. Uh, Joshua Lederberg won the Nobel Prize in 1958 for his seminal work on bacterial genetics, and he actually coined the term back then. So back in 1958, he posited that in fact we were healthy because we carried all these organisms uh, with us and they were contributing to our health. Now obviously it's taken decades for the science to catch up with that vision. So how did we get to today where this is really a bit of a revolution in medicine? Well, as Dr. Nelson mentioned, it really was because of technology. We developed these incredible capacities to sequence DNA, not only from human cells, but also from all these microbes that we carry with us. And in parallel, there was a huge effort to develop the bioinformatics to allow us to really understand that information. In about eight, nine years ago, this led the National Institutes of Health to start what was called the Human Microbiome Project. And the first phase of that was really to understand what the ecology was, just the baseline of what was the differences in the microbes we each carried with us, because it was suddenly understood that we didn't really know enough about this. So what are the big things we learned? Well, first we learned the colon, my favorite organ, is king. So within the colon is the largest number and the greatest density of microbes in the body, predominantly bacteria. We also learned that every single surface of our body that's 
uh, out to the environment and our mucosa, so all the invaginations over by our mouth, our vagina, our urethra, are also colonized with organisms that we live what we call symbiotically or together with uh, in health. Now, one of the fascinating parts of that, and you've heard this alluded to already, is that you can have a different microbiome really in every single environment on your body. And in fact, on the skin, it's thought that there's sort of moment by moment changes in the microbiome along the skin from your elbow to your hand. And people are now trying to understand why the system is so complex. Why is that important? Uh, to our health. And perhaps the most important thing we've learned is that in total contrast to what Dr. Nelson said about your human genes, we are each more different than we are similar. So he said we were 99.9% .9 the same genetically. Well, I'm going to tell you the microbes on your body are at least 97% different compared to the person sitting next to you. So there's this vast display of organisms that we acquire during the course of our life from the moment we are born. So if we're all so different, why are we so convinced that these microbes actually are critical to us being healthy? Well, what we've learned is that there's functional redundancy. So while all the different microbes we carry may be different, they're actually the cooperativity of all those genes they carry with us is, is the same or similar between individuals. And that is how we, uh, in part, maintain our health. Now, when do we first notice that? Well, again, it goes back to history. So it was in the 1930s when the first germ-free mice appeared. And germ-free mice don't have any microbes. Um, and what was noticed is they eat like mad. They eat like mad and they don't gain weight. Now that's something some of us would like on some days of the week. Uh, but what was then observed is if we gave them bacteria, they in fact ate 30% less but started to gain weight over the course of just two weeks. So we learned that those bacteria actually have the genes to digest uh, components of our diet that our human cells do not have the enzymes uh, to digest. And further, that the microbes are able to make vitamins and other essential nutrients that are required for our health. So this is called symbiosis, where we're very dependent on them, and it turns out they're actually also dependent on us. So there are things from our human cells that go to the bacteria and also help them be healthy. Now, what else have we learned? Well, we've learned that this amazing number of microbes that we carry with us actually make us resistant to disease. Uh, perhaps the best example of this is when we take antibiotics and in some cases develop what's called Clostridium difficile diarrhea. And how many have heard of Clostridium difficile? How many have heard of a fecal microbiota transplant? Quite a few, quite a few. So that's probably our best and at this point only example where it's unequivocal that being given the feces, this is not aesthetically pleasing, I realize it's breakfast, so given the feces from another person who is healthy can actually cure that disease. And as it turns out, Clostridium difficile has proved to be very recalcitrant, both in the hospitals and in the community, and tends to recur in patients. So it can be very morbid for patients, if not life-threatening, and that's because the organism has an antibiotic-resistant spore. So you can kill off all the bugs, and then that spore just blooms into more bugs uh, the minute the antibiotics are gone. So FMT, as it is called, is an example of using microbiota to cure disease. A second example is if you take um, the gut of a germ-free animal, it will have very few capillaries. 
But if you even add one bacteria to that gut, those capillaries bloom. And so it's thought that our bacteria provide products to our cells that help to drive the development of our organs. So our tissue development as we're young is also thought to be dependent in part on the microbiota. And lastly, the microbiota is thought to contribute to the development of our immune system, and if you will, the proper development of our immune system as we were just hearing about what can go wrong from Dr. Mano. Now, the, I want to turn to the concept of microbiome and disease now, because this has been blossoming. I was mentioning to Harriet uh, before the program that there is, it's, it's just a burgeoning amount of literature. I sort of feel like I need to take a week off and put myself in a room and just sit and read, because there's so many exciting things happening in this world. If we think about how disease occurs, there are three general models from the viewpoint of an infectious diseases specialist. One is that single bacteria can cause disease, and there's no question that that's true. We know that Helicobacter pylori is the cause of a majority of gastric cancer around the world. We know that much of community-acquired pneumonia is due to acquisition of the organism called pneumococcus. So single organisms can make us very ill and do cause both acute and chronic diseases. We also know that we're diseases, as you just heard, like inflammatory bowel disease, where we believe that there's a community of organisms that work together with the gene changes in the host to cause disease. In that disease, it's been very difficult, and to date we have not succeeded in identifying specific bacteria, so it's actually thought that it's the community of bacteria that's important to disease. And the last model is the idea that there are particular organisms that we can carry with us that have particular virulence or properties that allow them to talk to the other bacteria in their presence and actually mold that into a community that is then disease producing. So we now understand that bacteria make hormones, they make a lot of metabolites, and all of those factors that they secrete actually change the community into a new function. So Dr. Mano told you about microbiome and the development of autoimmune disease, which is one burgeoning area of work. But let me mention several others. And since I last spoke at this meeting about three years ago, this area, as I just said, is just increasing uh, in importance. So one uh, disease I would want to mention is obesity. So again, let's turn to history. When did we first notice that bacteria might be contributing to gaining weight? It was actually in the 1950s when farmers noticed that if they put small amounts of antibiotics in the food of the animals that they were raising, that those chickens or pigs got plumper and, of course, brought more when they were sold. It was a phenomenon that has not been understood for decades until a few years ago, Marty Blazer created a mouse model that replicated these findings and showed that this is in part due to the microbiome. Uh, Jeff Gordon, a wonderful microbiome researcher in St. Louis, has subsequently taken twins, so now identical twins, and taken and one of which has become overweight, one of which has remained lean, taken the stool from each of those twins and put them into germ-free mice on a particular diet, and one mouse gets overweight and one mouse stays thin. And it gets even more interesting if he then co-houses those mice, and mice are coprophagic, so they eat each other's feces, so you know they're exchanging this material. The overweight mouse will lose weight. So lean microbiota wins, which is sort of a nice thought. Um, but, big but, it requires the right diet. So if they put the mice on what's called a fruit and vegetable diet, we see that effect. If they put them on the potato chip diet, we don't see that effect. <laughs> so your microbiota is never going to beat out your diet in terms of weight maintenance. 
Further, in that model, you can take the stool from the overweight mouse and put it in a completely healthy mouse, and that mouse will gain weight. So we have uh, undeniable data now from many disease models, and that's just one experiment, that suggests that the fecal microbiota can actually encode disease potential which is why people are so excited about trying to pursue and understand this so we can develop new markers of disease and hopefully uh, it, as well as new therapies, something I'll come back to uh, in a moment. Uh, another example is malnutrition. I don't want to think we've focused solely on obesity because around the world malnutrition, which is also linked to poor cognitive development, is now also linked to the microbiome. Exactly the same experiments done. Twins from the um, developing world, uh, one who is uh, having chronic diarrhea, malnutrition, a twin who is healthy, do exactly the same experiment, put those into mice. You have a mice, a mouse who becomes malnourished, and a mouse that remains healthy. And then looking at how you can modulate that. It also is important to note that um, these mouse experiments, mice are not people, but it is um, very helpful that the mouse experiments seem to model uh, the human diseases because there's many things we can do in mice in terms of developing therapies and trying to understand how to manipulate this. It would be extremely difficult uh, to do in people. Heart disease. So again, we know that red meat, egg, cheese-laden diet are uh, potentially bad for us. Uh, Stan Hazen at the Cleveland Clinic has now shown that those diets induce a certain set of organisms in the gut that can metabolize those foods into a metabolite called TMA or trimethylamine, and we absorb that metabolite from the gut. It goes to the liver. The liver modifies it into what's called TMAO for adding an oxide group. It's an enzymatic reaction. And that metabolite goes to the blood vessels and helps to lay down the plaque that contributes to heart disease. And he has now conducted very large population studies that show us that TMA levels are linked to or associated with the onset of stroke, heart attacks, and death. So really hard outcomes that obviously matter. Now what's unclear is one, can we disrupt that process in the gut? And just a couple months ago, he published a proof of principle paper that suggested in fact you could identify inhibitors of those development of that metabolite that would just stay in the gut and do their job there, so therefore not likely to have a systemic effect on patients. So an encouraging uh, first step. We also don't know that uh, we should be ordering a TMAO on everybody in this room. So we don't yet know that we can use that metabolite as a bedside test to help individual patients. But at least in a population level, this is really new insight into how we develop uh, heart disease. Uh, colon cancer, I told you I moved from diarrheal diseases into colon cancer, and that was because as we took a decade-long journey to try to understand how a particular bacterium was causing diarrheal disease, we kept running into cancer pathways. Now, I am not an oncologist, but I, I work with people at Hopkins who are wonderful colon cancer researchers like Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler, and they were making findings that actually I found intersected with what we were seeing. So that led us to ask the question, could the bacteria be contributing to colon cancer? And indeed, we can add a single bacterium of different types to the very complex microbiota and change the potential for colon cancer in the mouse. And further, we've been able to identify that these organisms are pretty common in the general population, and further, that communities of these organisms can accumulate on the surface of the colon and, in fact, are carcinogenic. 
So here the big task and the vision is to try to take that very detailed information and figure out a way to detect the right bacteria in the stool. So instead of getting your preventive colonoscopy over the age of 50, which I hope everyone in this room has done because it's life-saving, that we will be able to have a simpler stool test or similar test in order to identify people at the highest risk for colon cancer who then would likely go on and get colonoscopy. Around the globe, colon cancer is one of the cancers that is increasing uh, quite a bit in the developing world. And so again, this gives us a chance to address uh, global health, we hope. The gut-brain axis. So there's a whole spectrum of diseases, the autism spectrum disorder, depression, stroke, and cognitive development that are increasingly being linked to the microbiome and how it may influence the neural connections between the gut and the brain. This is an early area of research, but we were fortunate enough to have John Cryan from University of Cork at Hopkins last week, who just presented a fascinating uh, discussion about this developing science. So stay tuned, because I think this uh, holds some promise. Now, Dr. Nelson introduced this amazing field of cancer immunotherapy. And I, in parallel to its potential to treat patients, we learned last fall through two really exciting papers that the capacity of the immunotherapy to work may be linked to particular bacteria in the gut of patients. Now, this work was done in mice, but it's spurring a huge effort now to, in parallel to studying the genetics of the cancer and the responses to follow the microbiome of patients. So we can look at the microbiome of patients who respond versus the microbiome of patients who do not respond for two purposes. One, to understand if there are particular micro microbes that appear to be associated with response, which would give us an avenue to develop what I would call a rational probiotic to see if we give that to patients who have markers that suggest they're not going to respond, can we actually improve their response to immunotherapy? And in converse, we would have the opportunity to understand if there are particular organisms associated with not responding so that we could look for those up front and potentially eliminate them from the patient's microbiome and give them a greater opportunity, we would hope, to respond to immunotherapy. So a, a completely new area of research that you're gonna see developing over the next few years. And the last area I wanted to mention is vaccination. Now both antibiotics and vaccination change the face of global health. These are two of the greatest advances uh, mankind has seen in medicine. However, we know that in the United States where we've eliminated polio, that we see different responses to the vaccine than say a country in uh, say India, where we're still having trouble getting polio under control. Well, there's new work to suggest that the responses to certain vaccines may be dependent on the microbiome. And that sort of logically makes sense in a place like India where enteric diseases or gut diseases uh, occur so frequently. So this is another area of development where we're hoping it will help us uh, improve vaccination rates both around the world and in the elderly. So ultimately, of course, the goal of all this work is to improve prevention and therapy uh, for patients. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we, are, we are one with our microbes, and for the most part, we should be very grateful for that because this is actually why we're healthy. However, there's a phenomenal amount to learn, and the prospects are really uh, exciting for harnessing this microbial world to the benefit of care. Thank you very much. <laughs>